Hello, everybody. Um, so the first thing I want to say is I'm sorry. Um, my uh, boyfriend says that when I do public speaking, I'm like the opposite of a stand-up comedian. So I apologize because <laughs> it's not fun, actually. And, and, and quite often, I go and give talks, and I'm very conscious of the fact that I feel that I've given a room full of people a terminal prognosis. Um, so what Extinction Rebellion wants you to do is something I was trying to think about before I uh, planned to come here and speak. And I think the first, and the first thing that came into my mind was that uh, face death. And um, facing your own mortality and facing the fact that we are living in a world which is in a state of, of cascading death. And we know that we live in this very sort of death phobic culture, right? Which is ironic, really, given how uh, violent and destructive it is. But I think for me that grief is an extremely constructive human state to be in. And um, that's very helpful for us because, you know, we're a change movement. Um, and it's not a popularity contest, being part of this rebellion. And, uh, and I think we need to recognize ourselves as sort of moving closer to the status of all of those other endangered species uh, that we talk about. And something that I feel that we've done together as a movement is to think about what you do when you're faced with the immorality of a government and a society and a culture that is planning the destruction of the next generation. And in particular, in the legal sense, we've sort of drawn attention to the fact that this means we're co collectively committing crimes against humanity. Um, now, it's not a fringe opinion anymore. Um, we've uh, got David Attenborough, national treasure, telling people that we face societal collapse and uh, that there can be no action too radical. Um, the Secretary General of the UN telling us that we have uh, less than two years, which, by the way, is almost up that time, uh, that he said to start to turn our lives around in... Um, ways which are completely unprecedented all over the world. Um, the ex-Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, has been out on the streets with us. He agrees that it's not really surprising that people feel they need to break the law uh, yeah. in a peaceful way at this point to get their, themselves heard. And uh, Mark Carney explaining to businesses that they're going to go bust and that with ecological collapse will come economic collapse. That's, that's an inevitability. And we've also seen many uh, unlikely allies, shall we say, sitting in the streets together. So ex-police officers, uh, with doctors, with teachers, with children, even like farmers sitting down with vegans in the street, right, uh, can come together because... And that's the one thing that I think we've done really fairly well as a starting point to bring these unlikely allies together and start to build a broad church and recognise the universal threat that all of this is. And so, what these times are asking of us um, is an interesting question. And, um, and I guess I just want to ask you guys some questions. So if, if you don't mind, if you would just all stand up out of your seat. And um, so, stay stood up if the answer is yes to this question. Okay, uh, do you think that your work and your life is making the climate an ecological emergency worse? If you think yes, stay stood up. If you think no, sit down. Okay, cool. Stay stood up, since you, since you all are. Um, uh, do you think that you'll live to see an unrecognisable planet to the one that you were born on? If yes, stay stood up. Okay. Um, people who sat down, just stand up one more. 
Um, state stood up if the answer is yes. Have you ever cried because of the state of our environment and our, and our environmental crisis? Okay, cool. All right, cool. You are paying attention, most of you. Sit down. <laughs> That's cool. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, I guess what we're trying to what we're trying to do with this movement is get people to face up to reality. Okay, and um, the reality is that we're in this kind of grave, grave risk. And um, there's a scientist who I recommend you look up if you don't know his work, Professor Sean Huber um, from the Potsdam Institute, and he's just done a whole load of work around risk assessment. He's been looking at the insurance industries, he's been looking at uh, the methodologies they use to assess risk, and he's been looking also at air traffic controllers. They use a, a different method which looks at kind of the time you have left to act before the event happens, which is slightly different to, to the insurance methods. And so he's estimated that we have uh, already gone into a 10% chance that we're going to experience a runaway warming event, which means that we can't stop it or go back from it and that the cost of that to the global economy will be somewhere between 100 trillion euros and the uh, loss of civilized uh, life completely. Uh, he also brought a very interesting provocation to a conference a year or two ago where he described to some scientists, you know, the first rule of humanity is don't kill your own children. Um, and I think this is... This is interesting. The alarm bells are, you know, they, they've been ringing for some time, but when you really listen to some of the things that people have been saying, there is, there is no uh, understanding on my part of, like, why people are not entirely joining us on the streets. Why isn't everybody sitting out there and saying, no, enough, you know? When, when, the, when Christina Figueira is, has said, you know, at 1.5 degrees, there will be no business continuity, the future is uninsurable if we meet our Paris targets. And we're not going to, right? We're headed for like three to four degrees of average warming by the end of this century, not 1.5. We are miles away from doing that. <coughs> so, um, in the short term, what does this mean? Uh, we've got this sort of massive loss of biodiversity. We're in an extinction event. Some people have said, you know, this is the sixth mass extinction that we can find. Uh, the geological record shows us five previous. But the question now has been raised, is it the first mass extermination? Because actually we don't have any proof that sentient species caused any of those previous extinction events. Um, we know that we're going to lose the Arctic. We know that there are many, many feedback mechanisms built into the Earth systems that mean that as things get hotter, things are going to get worse quicker and quicker, and it's going to become self-perpetuating. I think many people don't realise quite how simple some of this stuff is. You know, water vapour is a greenhouse gas, so as it warms up, there will be more of that. The pollution in our atmosphere is cooling the planet because it's stopping radiation from coming in. So as we clean it up, it's going to get hotter again. You know, we, that's why we made this banner, because it was like nobody actually says this to the general public. And the third sector and the environmental sector, everybody is behind closed doors and in the pub going, oh my God, we are fucked. And nobody would say it. So we made this huge, huge banner to explain that. Um, the oceans we know are acidifying and rising. There's a village in Wales that has begun to plan its decommissioning by 2025 because people won't be able to live there anymore. Um, island states have described our climate negotiations as the equivalent of signing a suicide pact. Um, Air pollution, the World Health Organization says that 7 million people die every single year because they're breathing toxic air. Nearly 10,000 of those are in London, and I've campaigned quite hard on that as well. Um, we know that our food systems are fragile, actually. They work just in time. Our food in the UK comes from all over the world. We import over 50% of what we eat. Um, the major breadbasket bread regions of the world are at increased risk of... Um, extreme weather events which will cut people's crop yields down and also grain yields will drop while the temperature goes up. 
and the centre of continents warms much quicker than the global average. That's where those bread baskets are. So for sure, we're looking at a future agricultural crisis, as far as I can see uh, the evidence. In the UK, we've got these horrendous floods, people losing their homes, losing everything. I know people in Yorkshire still haven't been paid out from their insurance from major flooding that happened eight years ago. The insurance industry are pulling policies from people in Australia, in California. Those fires are blazing as we speak. And the UK rail networks are unfit for the future in terms of climate change. The bosses have started to speak out about that. Heat waves are going to become more frequent and more long running. So we know that we're facing this grave danger. So why exactly are we not taking it quite as seriously as we ought to? So in Extinction Rebellion, we have these three core demands. I'll just roll, you might know them already. The first one is tell the truth. And I think uh, for everybody to tell the truth and for the government to tell the truth, but certainly for us to tell it to ourselves, OK? Because we've got to face up to reality in order to be able to deal with this. And the converging crises, you know, that's why we called the movement Extinction Rebellion, because it's not just about um, talking about climate breakdown, right? It's, there's many, many other problems. The second demand is act now. So we're demanding that we reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2025, reverse biodiversity loss, reversing consistent policies with that. Um, and again, on a personal level, act now is about being embodied. Um, it's about taking action. Um, and I think for me, this is about courage. And courage is like open hearted, it is vulnerable. It's not just being brave and like putting up a putting on a stern face and going out and taking it. It's actually, for me, it's, it's, it's very much about being tender with yourself and with each other. And, uh, you know, we, we, we launched with this saying, tell the truth and then act as if the truth is real. So these two things come together. And the third demand is for a citizens' assembly. You'll hear more from uh, somebody from the Sortition Foundation later about this. So it's about reinvigorating our democratic process and recognizing that politics is not working for us. We've had 30 years of alarm bells ringing and everything's just got worse. Emissions, in fact, have gone up 60% in 30 years after we were told to reduce them then. So what is politically possible is not really of interest to us anymore. There's something that we need to get done and we need to start talking about that. And for that, we need a system change. Um, and we certainly feel, I think, a lot of us at Extinction Rebellion that we're at our choice point in humanity's history where certainly in this country we can either choose to have more democracy or we can choose to have less. But I don't think we can just carry on business as usual. So Extinction Rebellion came out of this movement called Rising Up. It was a group of decentralized uh, kind of network of activists working to um, iteratively test out tactics of civil disobedience, um, looking really at the virtue of disobedience um, and mass participation being a key factor. You know, I've spoken to lots of people that do direct action and it's, and it's the mass participation part that comes along with nonviolence, which is so powerful that we see in the examples that we've been inspired by. And we launched this with a talk. And so I think a lot of people think that Extinction Rebellion is like something that's come in the age of the internet, right? And it's like gone round on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Not true. There's a talk called Headed for Extinction and What to Do About It. And that was drafted collaboratively by several people. And then it toured the country before we launched. And probably, I think it was given somewhere between 60 and 100 times. I'm not sure. But it had a form that you filled out round the room, people could sign up, and it said three boxes to tick. And it said, do you want to help? Would you be willing to be arrested? Would you be willing to go to prison? And then after we'd done those talks and we gathered up those phone numbers and those emails and we started to form some small groups, that's, that's when we sort of launched it. And so it's very much about being face to face with people. It's quite old fashioned community kind of style organizing. And I think that's really kind of interesting uh, in the age where everyone thinks like clicks matter, right, because they don't really do anything. Um, so the first thing, one of the first things that we did was we went and occupied uh, the offices of UK Greenpeace. Um, and again, that was something which, um, you know, with some environmentalists went down like a cup of cold sick. 
and um, they were like, who do you think you are? You can't do that. And actually, we, you know, we took them a love letter and some cake and flowers, and we had a very long meeting with some senior staff in there who, you know, the whole table was in practically in tears talking about, you know, how we're losing the fight against climate change, right? Um, we tested out different things like breaking bail terms. People breaking bail three, four times in a week, going straight back to where they'd painted a government building and then going back and doing it again and going in court and going in court until you get sent on remand. Um, myself and a group of others went on hunger strike last summer for two weeks to, um, to campaign against the expansion of Heathrow Airport to the British Labour Party. Um, all of this stuff pisses people off. And particularly being like starving yourself for two weeks, lots of people got in touch with me and said, Claire, I'm really worried about you and that's not cool. And please, can you stop? And I'm a bit angry with you. And it's in that moment where I realized, and I didn't know how this worked at the time, I just said, yeah, I'll do it, that actually that's what's useful about that, is that those people get very upset. And when they say, I'm upset about this, you say, right, cool, worry about that, please. Like, I'm fine, <laughs> but I'm this worried about this other thing every day, all the time. And the people that I thought were listening to me, that were my friends or my family or whatever, and I thought they heard what I was saying to them for the last how, God knows how long that I've been saying that this is really serious, they weren't actually hearing it. And so when they woke up and saw me, you know, starving myself, that really, it changed their, their perception of what I was doing and why. Um, and it was important. So we have um, built ourselves up a kind of self-organizing system it's inspired by holacracy. Probably lots of you know about that. I didn't know anything about it when we started. Um, we aim to have a regenerative culture, and for me, part of that is about um, remaining detached from outcomes. So you're much more able to be in love with process and do good work sometimes when you're not completely like hanging on for what comes. And particularly in activism, you know, you're so likely to lose, right? That it's super not cool to be attached to the idea of winning because the odds are so stacked against you. People tend to be more effective when they feel they're doing something because it's the right thing to do, not because it's like uh, they, they know that they're going to win. Um, we have a very multidisciplined team, which is really cool to work with. So, you know, philosophers working with social scientists, working with sci real scientists, working with activists, long-term activists, working with artists. And this is um, a print table where, where we set up in the streets. And this is on the bridge, on Waterloo Bridge from April. And people print on their own clothes with, like, wooden printing blocks. So as an arts coordinator, we've built this system where people can do this work together and we have a no merchandise movement, which I think is super important. We've said to people, this is a, this is a do it together movement, it's not a DIY um, aesthetic. Um, everything that we do is like a freely available creatively to use, but it's all non-commercial. And importantly, we don't own that symbol that was designed by somebody else. And we have to protect that because that's strictly for non-commercial use and we've been given the blessing of an anonymous artist to use that ongoing, but it needs looking after. Um, and for me, that gives us a great, uh, a, a great sort of thing to work around in terms of having this sort of like collaborative set of assets to start out with, which we have to see as like commons that they're not, you know, we don't own them, uh, but they do need taken care of. So, Um, there's this thing uh, you might know, I only read about it quite relatively recently, uh, called the Jevons Paradox. And I'm guessing a lot of you work in sustainability, and this learning about this really like, opened my eyes to something, because it's an efficiency paradox. And this um, 18th century economist recognized that when we make an efficiency saving, at that time using coal um, to, to power stuff, that that efficiency saving results in you using more coal, not less. And I thought back about like working on sustainability and how people often begin that work with efficiency, saving. And I thought, you know what, like, we don't even know 
what questions to ask. So, of course, we don't find all the right answers very easily. And one of the words that we've printed on people's clothes again and again is humility and talking to people about what that actually means. And for me, there's something about using all of the stuff that we've got in silos, science, all of the things that we think that are necessary to ca combat these issues around um, biodiversity loss, climate change. These are like, I think they're scientific things that we need to investigate. But until we get like different types of people together to work on this stuff, then you, we're not asking the right questions. We're not finding the right place to begin. And so, I guess what we, what we definitely need to do is to come together and admit to ourselves that we know what's happening well enough. We don't need any more scientific reports to tell us that stuff. And we kind of know what's needed to get, begin to do the work. And we also know that we need grief. And we also know that we need love. And I think we also need, know that we need to defeat cynicism somehow. <laughs> um, and to lift up our consciousness together. And so, in this sort of moment where we're engaged in a slow uh, car crash together um, in a like, long tragedy, if you were, I guess if you were personally going like, to let go of false hope and let go of denial and really face up to the reality of what's happening, and think about the first next thing that you can do that you know you might be able to do but you're not doing. Uh, what is that thing in being in service to life itself? Um, and I just want to give you like one or two minutes. If you look at the person next to you um, and just say something that you could be doing that you're not doing, that you, that you know really, and have a little, just one to two minutes, just very quickly.